I'm Steve Clemens. I direct the American Strategy Program at the New America Foundation. I blog at the Washington Note. I'm here with my friend Jamie Galbraith from the University of Texas, Austin, one of America's leading uh, economic thinkers. And we just had a conference today uh, focused on America's debt overhang. Jamie, one of the I mean, really interesting uh, issues that have come out of this conference is the differentiation between public debt and private debt. And what we've been having uh, in recent years is a buildup and a bubble in, pri in private debt, huge private debt. Maybe you can go into that. And, and, and you know, at the same time, the relative level of government debt uh, was rather modest. And I think that sort of runs against conventional wisdom. Can you share a few thoughts well, on I this? Well, I think what people need to understand is that the public debt and the private debt are, are they're in a reciprocal or a balancing relationship with each other. And what happened in the boom period was that the private debt, debt built up. That generated a lot of income, which generated a lot of tax revenues, and as a result, deficits were fairly small. Uh, and in fact, uh, for a period in the late 1990s, we were in surpluses because of a very strong private credit bubble. When the private sector collapsed, the housing bust hit in 2007, 2008, and the, the banks basically collapsed at the, uh, a year ago, uh, the tax revenues collapsed. Public expenditures went up as a result of unemployment insurance uh, and other relief measures and then the stimulus package, and the public deficit rises automatically. Hmm. And that's what stabilizes the system, because what the public deficit is doing is putting income into the pockets of private households and companies. It's giving, it's, it's providing them with more extra income in spending than it is taking out in taxes. Do you have a concern that now uh, fiscal budget hawks are, 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 are building uh, a base that could be very destructive for the country at a very vulnerable point? If you react to this too rapidly by, by, by pulling back on the public position, uh, by trying to close that public deficit, you're basically assuming that the private credit sector is going to jump right back in and start lending, that private individuals are going to start borrowing, you're going to get a kind of privately funded credit expansion. It's not going to happen. The crisis was a very deep and very severe one. The institutions are impaired. They are not going to come back and generate a new credit-driven boom. And as a result, the public deficit is going to stay large. And the effort to cut it back simply means you're going to have less public activity and more unemployment. You'll get the public deficit either way. Now, Barack Obama is not out there saying, let's embrace big deficits. You did to say today, we need to embrace big deficits. What Can you give me a perhaps a friendly critique, or even an unfriendly critique of the Obama team? What should they be doing that they're not doing today that you think is vital for the economy? Well, I think it's one of the jobs of the president to change the frame of discussion of economic policy from an unrealistic one to a realistic one and to explain things to the larger population in a way that uh, enables you to achieve public purpose, uh, but without uh, you know, sort of catering too much to people's preconceptions. You don't have to like the deficits. You don't have to like the public debt. You may find it very unattractive. You may, I think, a great many people in good faith would prefer an economy with a stronger private sector. I would prefer an economy with a stronger private sector. But in order to get there, you have to pass through this period of extended and very large public uh, activity and public deficits. Uh, and recognizing that, I think, is a, you know, help will help you, maybe not immediately. You may take a pr pay a price because you can take a lot of cheap shots from demagogues. But down the road, people will begin to say, yes, that was right. And then you will reap the benefits of having told the truth uh, and having also perhaps been more effective at getting your program through so that you're able to sustain an effort that will actually help provide people with the jobs uh, that they need. Let me just ask finally, you know, most, most analysts see very robust third and fourth quarters coming uh, in GDP yes, growth. Yeah, We've had, we have uh, people in the Obama administration mm -hmm. uh, who've said uh, offline to me that they're expecting a GDP recovery and not a jobs recovery. Yeah. Should we be satisfied with that? Should, you know, where, where does the jobs picture, the public infrastructure issue, the issue of doing something, the kind of restructuring that you advocate, are we doing any of that during the time of this enormous crisis that we should be doing? And, and and talk a little bit about the jobs picture. Yeah. First of all, I think that's right. We are going to see a, a GDP recovery and not a jobs recovery. And that is going to be ex extremely frustrating 
to the vast uh, uh, mass of American working people who are not going to see their opportunities improving. Um, the, the, it's probably, there's probably nothing you can do about that in the next six months. It's mm -hmm. baked into the cake. Uh, you could, but you need to maintain focus on uh, the need to deal with the jobs problem. Because if the GDP recovery flags after two quarters, then there will be no further improvement on the jobs front mm -hmm. either. And you will be in a long period of, uh, let's say, sustained near 10% unemployment. And that's totally unacceptable. It's politically unacceptable. It's economically unacceptable. It would be disastrous from larger uh, social standpoint. So you've got to f start saying, OK, how do we get funds to state and local governments so that they're not laying off their teachers and their, their firemen and their police and their other public servants, but in fact expanding those programs so as to bring new people on board and provide job opportunities? How do we go about um, you know, providing a framework where people can do the work that needs to be done? A huge amount of weatherization, for example. You could create millions of jobs in that sector. You can create jobs in, in, in caring sectors, in health and education. There's a great deal of, of, of work that isn't done now because people can't afford it. But bringing people who would otherwise be unemployed into that kind of activity doesn't use up a lot of extra resources. They're going to be fed on the dole mm. or on unemployment insurance one way or another. Much better to do, put the extra effort into creating a set of institutions that will actually say, okay, this is what we'll call a job, mm -hmm. uh, and it will do something useful, and at the end of the day, you will have spent you know, a, a period of years working, uh, and we'll find that, that when that happens, the private sector will make more use of those people, because private employers, when they look for workers, they look for mm -hmm. people who are already working. They don't like to hire the unemployed. They can find people who are already working, so you, you ended up with a... Um, with, with uh, if you if you neglect a self fulfilling the problem, negative spiral, you end up with spiral. a huge part of the population yeah. which is essentially permanently unemployed. It's a disaster. Right. right. Well, Jamie, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you for talking. My Thanks pleasure. very much. Of course.